Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, Alabama. is our church. This whole network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. It's been a day. Welcome, everybody. Everybody here and everybody out there. I didn't know what to say. I usually don't know what to say. And so our producer just gave me a couple things. One was on humility, and a friend of mine went, yeah. So we don't talk about humility tonight. I'd squeeze it in just a little bit. <laughs> then we talked about... Uh, Somebody asked for the consequences of sin. This world and the next. I thought that was kind of interesting. Do you think that's kind of interesting? Oh, yeah. But I think before we know or even talk about the consequences of sin, I think we need to know what is the real reason. There we kind of goof off sometime, huh? So. At lesson this morning, we took a paragraph. It seemed like it was three or four paragraphs, but it ended up to be one paragraph. And I think maybe we could adapt it to ordinary life rather than religious life. And I'm going to, I'm going to read you this. It's four lines. No, don't turn me off. Well, <laughs> I don't have the page. You know, it's amazing about being up here. You lose everything for some reason. You, I think it was St. John. He must be in this book. He's around. I had him this morning. Oh, come on. Here we go. Here we go. It's coming. It's coming. Here it is. I think. Hmm. Isn't that terrible, huh? Are you getting nervous? <laughs> <laughs> you know, getting nervous. And I, this popped in my head. It has absolutely nothing to do with what I'm about to talk about. Absolutely nothing. But I got to find this thing. Okay, I got it. One time uh, when I was in high school, um, I was a drum majorette. That would be a shock to some of you. <laughs> and I used to lead the high school band wherever they went. And I kept time for them. And um, not that I knew anything about time, but they told me what to do, so I did it. Anyway, what, uh, the Shrine Circus came along that year. And one of the Shriners saw me, thought I was pretty good. And so he wanted to know if I'd like to join the circus for a week. And I said, how much? I mean, why would I want to just join the circus, you know? And my immediate, even then, it was terrible. I was, how much do I get for this thing? <laughs> See, that little fall has been with me ever since. But anyway, he said $25, and I, in those days, that was a lot of money. And so I said, yeah. I forgot to tell my mother. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I didn't deliberately do it, I just forgot to tell her. And so I, here, here I am and come down Market Street with this uh, circus band of elephants and, and she was walking down the street and she went, yeah! <laughs> so I, I looked at her, smiled, and she did not smile back. <laughs> And so what happened was that after I got into the circus, she came running and she said, are you out of your mind? I said, no, it's $25. She said, oh, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> well, she, she decided that evening to join the circus, not the circus, but the audience. And, but when she saw me coming in, she was so nervous that I drop the baton, slip on the floor, knock into the elephant, whatever it was. She was so nervous, she ran out of that thing. I thought she was sick, but she just scared, see. And I think sometime when I lose my place in scripture, everybody's wondering, oh, will she ever find it? Why didn't she plan it ahead of time? What's wrong with this nun? Well, all of heaven has been trying to figure that one out <laughs> for a long time. But here we're talking now about the consequences. The consequences of that circus was very interesting because I always desired when I was a little kid to pull the hair out of an elephant. <laughs> what well, is better in desiring pickle than midnight? Do you ever desire to pull a hair out of an elephant? You never did. Nobody here did? Oh, it must be some psychological slip somewhere. Anyway, I went back in. I said to the, you know, the head of all the animals, the trainer, I said, did you ever pull a hair out of one of your elephants? He said, no. And I said, well, I always wanted to do that. I got a baby here. Hmm. I said, uh, what would happen if I pulled the hair out of that little elephant. And he said, I don't know. I've never done it. I said, uh, mind if I try? No. I thought, well, he ought to know. <clears throat> oh, that poor little elephant squealed all over the place. I didn't think it would hurt him. You know, he looked like he had a lot of them and it didn't look <laughs> like he would miss one. And the mother's what I almost got trampled on, but I didn't realize, see. That's a consequence of sin. I don't think it was a sin, but it had a consequence, see. You didn't think I'd get around to that, did you? Hmm? But that was a consequence. It was something I wanted to do, I shouldn't have, but I did it, and there was a consequence. Not only was I scared, but I think I ran the risk of that elephant going right through the tent. So everything we do has a consequence. If you go down the road 180 miles an hour, you, you know you're either going to just hide your plane or you're going to hit a tree or hit somebody. What is that? It's a consequence. If you drink a quart of whiskey, Oh, I guarantee you a consequence. And even if you took a quart and you drank a little at a time, you still have a terrible consequence. Bad headache. The next morning you probably wouldn't be able to go to work. These are consequences. And see, when the church, when the church says, thou shalt not in the voice of God, or you read the commandments, they're telling you they don't want you to suffer consequences. See? They're, they're not just saying, do not do this, just to wield some kind of authority. They're telling you what's going to happen if you do. You've all learned the hard way. You know? Your mother uh, told you not to do something, and you did it, and you fell in the mud, and then you had to come in and get washed, and yelled at, and then you, it's consequences, see? I want to tell you a little bit about why 
you do the things you shouldn't do. If you have your Bible, I would open up to the chapter John 14. 14 John, and go back to 23. There's 23. It's only four lines, one verse. And it says this, and I, I'm going to read it slow, so you understand what you're doing. It says, if, if anyone loves me, it's Jesus speaking, he will keep my word. Hear that? If anyone loves me, what will happen? He will keep my word. Isn't that the reason for so many divorces today? You get married and you're all excited. And a month passed, two months, three months, four months, all of a sudden something happens. You say, what? What happened? Well, love begins to wane sometimes. And you don't do what your husband or your wife wants you to do. Why? Why is it we have such a hard time doing God's will? I think it's because that's all we think about is God's will. So it's, it's a, a pull between my will and his will. If you love me, you will keep my word. So the problem, my friends, is not two wills. The problem is we don't love enough. That's the problem. If you're an alcoholic and all you think about is I can't, I can't, I won't, I mustn't. Hmm. But I think if you say God doesn't want me to do this, consequences are very serious. For love of him, I will not do this. Wouldn't that be different than just the idea I'm fighting? I'm fighting my will against God's will, against my husband, my wife's will, against my kid's will. We're always in that struggle of fighting and controlling my will and his will. But the whole answer is very clear. If you love me, you will keep my word. Some of you have such a hard time accepting God's will. There's a lot of things. we There's doing God's will is one thing. And sometimes it's not as hard as accepting. Oh, no, that's different, isn't it, huh? I have to accept God's will. And if I don't love him, I will neither do or accept. I think that's the answer to 90% of the problems in the whole wide world. Abortion is one, oh my, you know. How we ever verify, I mean, excuse uh, 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 killing a baby, innocent, not able to protect itself. And, and they don't even call it sin, it's a choice, oh no. So you neither love God, yourself, or the baby. And a, a total lack of love in abortion. You couldn't love yourself, why? Because consequences are so serious. Those of you who had abortion, been living with that for years and years, you know what I'm saying? Consequences. They don't tell you that, the clinic. They want you $400. And they too said they don't love God, so they don't care for you. They want your money and out. They don't care if you're bleeding. They don't care if you're well. They don't care what. And that's a consequence. And when you hear a baby cry, it hits your ear. Why? It's a consequence. It's an effect of something you just did. See, that's what's so important today. Nobody thinks of consequences. 
Now you can bury it for a while, you know, you can bury it in more sex, more liquor, more drugs. If all you do is pile up consequences, your liver begins to decay, you lose your family, you lose your wife, you lose sometimes God. It's a consequence. A serious consequence. I mean, you teenagers out there, you goofing off on weekends, you get pregnant. You get, you brag about it in school. It's like saying, I just offended God and I'm proud of it. Do you hear that? So I would never say that. Oh, you just did. See, you, you have to understand that this one sentence in 1423 of John Gospel, if anyone loves me, it's a sad thing the Lord would say, if anyone loves me, anyone, he will keep my word. You say, well, are there consequences to that? Oh, yeah, wonderful consequences to doing that. What is it? He tells us here. My father will love him. Oh, you cannot imagine for a moment that we can be loved by the father. In our new, our new chapel, temple, yeah, as you come in above the door is a, a picture of a glass, stained glass window of the Eternal Father. And, and when we put it there, we, we didn't know the consequences. We'd say, well, what do you mean? I said, well, we decided one day the one in the back would be the Holy Spirit. I thought that was nice. Then we realized, but in the middle, would be the Blessed Sacrament. So we realized one day, not too long ago, we had Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Awesome. But the consequence, I think, is going to be awesome. I have seldom seen a person go in that place, even now in construction, come out the same. Hmm. See, even good things have consequences. And this is what the Lord says to me and to you. If you're thinking of abortion tonight, you get your scripture and read this one word, if anyone loves me, anyone, and keeps my word, the Father will love him. There's nobody in this whole wide world feels adequately loved. You say, well, I'm adequately loved. Ah, oh, don't tell me every day the thought of the one you love or loves you doesn't cross your mind. They're getting old. And one day they won't be here for me to love or be loved. That's a consequence of life. There's death, separation, all the things we don't want. But it's a consequence of our old bodies gone down, down, down. Now you can put up all the makeup you want. You can put on all the dye on your hair. The depth of your wrinkles, my friends, shows you're up there. And you're not coming down either. I mean, you're there. I went to a doctor today where he could check my asthma. And he said, how you doing? I said, oh, I'm fine. I get a little tired. He said, oh, really? I said, yeah. Something wrong with that? He said, no, you're 76. <laughs> you're supposed to get tired. I said, really? Why? He said, <laughs> you're getting old. 
I said, oh, I didn't know that. I just thought I'd be tired. It's a consequence, see? And what I'm trying to say, the reason we sin is we, we see, I could to say something, all my liberal friends are going to start jumping up and down. Well, sit down a minute before you jump. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. Oh, another consequence coming up, and we will come to him. Oh, you can't imagine that. What he's promising, that Jesus and the Father will come here, here. What a consequence of loving God. And then he says one statement that is, he said, and we will make our home with him. <laughs> you know, I told the sisters this morning, we went over this, and I said, you know, our Lord has a real knack of bringing everything up just the right words and, and a, a total explanation in four, in four sentences. Books and books and books, from John of the Cross to Teresa of Avila to the Little Flower of Jesus to Catherine of Siena to Bridget of Sweden, and the whole works have written books and books and books and more books, all to say this. <laughs> Ooh. I'm reading. I mean, I all want you to read all the books you can read. It's better than some of the stuff you read. But these four lines say it all. Oh. That the Father will come to me and they'll make our, their home in me. What is it to make a home? It's a place. The kingdom of heaven, Jesus said. Don't go around blaming the Holy Father. For goodness sakes, you guys are hard up. It was Jesus who said, the kingdom of heaven is where? Within you. Here, it says that. If I love God, isn't that the consequence, not loving God, the reason you sin? Yeah, sure. You love someone every minute. <laughs> when you sin, you love yourself alone. Or God, or the, not God, but the world alone. You have no love for anyone else at that moment. That's why parents hurt children and children hurt parents. Somewhere, somewhere, love has fallen away. But you see, if you loved him, and the Father came, and they both made their home in you, would you sin? I don't think so. Mm -mm. I don't think so, because you would never want to separate yourself from such a God, you know? Never. In a million years, you would never when to separate yourself from Jesus and the Father and the Spirit. The consequences of sin are in this life and the next. You say, well, I don't think that's right. You know, <laughs> it's not, a, let me tell you something, sweetheart. It's not a matter of your little old opinion. <laughs> Hmm. No way. What is, is. If you steal an apple, you stole an apple. Well, you could say, I was starving. We're not asking for a motive. You stole an apple. Is there a consequence? Yeah. Your conscience ought to say something to you. But there always is a consequence. Ooh, all you people smoke all of so much all the time. I saw a woman the other day smoking a cigar. 
In the South, we call them cigars instead of cigars. And either way, it stinks. <laughs> it, 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 the smoke is everywhere. They say they don't inhale them, but you gotta smell them. I mean, something has gone up your nose. It's close, see here and here? Close. You can puff it out to your neighbor, but it's got to go up. God made you a nose to smell with. Well, you there's a consequence. I saw a big billboard this afternoon. <laughs> I think the cancer people are trying so hard to put sense in our heads. He had this, oh, maybe about nine, ten-year-old kid up there, and he was going, <gasps> and it said there, yeah, sure, you can smoke in front of me. I just won't be able to breathe. I thought, that's the smartest ad I ever saw. The only funny part while we were waiting at a red light and the guy next to us was smoking away, reading the ad. <laughs> <laughs> the consequence of stupidity has to be something serious. Like you've been warned, you've been told, and you keep on doing it. You just keep on. It's a consequence, though, long term. You know, you can't smoke a cigarette and, and start uh, huffing and puffing and losing your breath. No. You don't get cancer overnight with one cigarette. It's a pack, two packs, a pack and a half, two packs, a pack and a half, two packs. You know, if you send that money here, you'd get a lot more out of it. <laughs> get yourself a little can. And every time you want to puff, what is it? How much a piece? Anybody know? You don't want to admit it. Anyway, <laughs> um, how much? Is that $2 a pack? Plus tax? How much? Two dollars and fifty cents to stuff your lungs up. Now you gotta pay for it. See, it used to be, I think when I was a kid, I used to help my uncle roll his own. You know, they had these little machines and he'd say, I'll give you a dime if you roll me a pack of cigarettes. I didn't know they were bad for you. I put a little piece of paper in there and I'd sprinkle tobacco and I'd push this little lever down and spit on it. <laughs> Before you knew it, he had a whole bag of cigarettes. Well, they died of a heart attack. Now, I'm not saying cigarettes did it, but. See, God didn't make your lungs for smoke to go in and out of but fresh air, there's a consequence, see? So the catechism says, sin is an act contrary to reason. <laughs> if smoking isn't contrary to reason, I don't know what is. We must look funny to the angels. <laughs> it's like to me, the exhaust of a car. You ever see an exhaust of a car? Yeah, you do. But the other day, I saw an exhaust of a truck. Unfortunately, we happened to be behind it. And it had black, cold, black smoke coming out of both exhausts. I mean, it was, I thought there ought to be a law against that. Talk about pollution. But I realized if I were to take the lungs of a, a chain smoker, after 20, 25 years, they would look exactly like that black smoke. In our little old town of Canton, Ohio, they were rather graphic about their desire that you quit smoking. And so they had in the window three lungs in formaldehyde. And I was fascinated, because they always had a different organ in there every two weeks. And I always was curious about what they looked like, and so I went there that day to see the lung, what the lung looked like. It had a good lung, 
It had a smoke-filled lung, and it had a lung that of a coal miner, a coal miner. The, the lung, that was a, a good lung, it was a healthy lung. Of course, the person died for, for some reason, but it was kind of pink. The other one was, the cancer lung was pure white, pure white. And the other lung was real dark, dark, dark black. Well, the poor men in the mines had to make a living. But there were consequences, huh? Poor people that smoked that much, there are consequences, huh? It reminded me of the pat, you know, pat. How many Irish here? You all have a pat joke, huh? Well, the poor priest was trying very hard to convince Pat that uh, he should stop drinking. It was not good for you. And he says, Pat, would you come over here? And Father had two glasses, and it had good clean water in both glasses. And he took a worm, and he put it in the glass with water, and it was swimming around so happy. It was one happy worm. And then he took the worm and put it in the whiskey glass. It was whiskey in one glass, water in the other. And the, the, the worm went plunk, dead at the bottom of the glass. And he looked, he said, Pat, what do you learn from this? Oh, Father, he said, if you drink whiskey, you'll never have worms. <laughs> Wrong consequence. <laughs> he and the worms be dead. But see, that is something you need to pray for. And, and, and I thought the light I had is good for all of us because you just can't get rid of something you have done over a long time. What do you do? You pray. But with that prayer has to lead you to love Jesus. Love is the only power that can make you do something hard that you should do. And that's what he says, see? Instead of next time saying, oh, this is so hard for me. It's God's will, but I'm going to do it, but I don't like it. I, you don't love enough. See? You're trying, and that's good. But most people wonder, why can't I do God's love? I know what I should do. I know what he wants me to do. Why can't I do it? I think this is the answer here. If you love me, you're going to keep my word. I think that's the, that's the whole work on loving God more. See? And, and we can increase that love every time I say no to me. Every time I say no to me, my love for him increases. See, it's going to do that. For the simple reason that loving God is a very strong motive. Now, isn't that different than just being so negative, and why do we have to do that? Because there are dire, terrible consequences, and one of the consequences is hell. Oh, here she goes again. Yeah, okay, so I go again. Nobody else is telling you about that place. When's the last sermon you heard about hell? Yeah, you don't even know. When was the last sermon anybody here heard about hell? No, oh, not one of you, huh? But you know, that's a consequence of grievous sin. And nobody wants to tell you where you're going. I think that's terrible. I don't believe in hellfire all the time. I don't believe you gotta preach about it 20 times a day. 
You know, in the road now here in Alabama, we have a lot of uh, construction on highways going on, and they warn you a mile ahead. It says, slow down to 50 miles an hour. And they got these little cars, you know, with the lights on the top, hidden behind the trees, see? <laughs> I never knew why so many drivers were so nice to Sister and I. They kept blinking their lights. <laughs> And I would say, Sister, aren't these drivers nice? That's their way of saying hello. <laughs> but I thought one day, there's too many drivers saying hello. <laughs> and then it dawned on me, there he was, sneaking behind some trees. And they were saying, <laughs> well, you know, they had that sign. They had a policeman there to be sure you didn't go over 50. And then they had these little orange things. You know, they're kind of like a, a barrel or something. They got white and orange stripes around. They started with those. Now this is way before construction. Well, I thought, what's all this fuss? They were warning me that up ahead there's a lot of big equipment and if you don't drive straight, you're gonna run into one of those and kill yourself. I appreciate those signs. I appreciate the state of Alabama. Well, I would anyway, but I appreciate the love they have for me as a passenger in a car to give me a mile ahead warning there is something ahead that's dangerous. And then at the end, it says, thank you. Please be careful. Well, I wanted to hug the whole state. <laughs> I bet you don't get mad at that. If you do, you're an egghead. <laughs> because somebody loves you enough to warn you. Well, let me tell you, you ought to get a little sermon on hell once in a while. Somebody should love you enough to say, if you do thus and thus, you run the risk of separating yourself from God forever. You see, really, when it comes down to it, it's all a matter of love. You say, well, what about purgatory? Yeah, sure, that's a consequence. You didn't do it here, you're gonna do it there. <laughs> you're not gonna get out of it. You're not gonna get out of it. You don't walk to heaven hating Aunt Susie. You don't go into heaven hating your ex-wife, your ex-husband, your ex-whatever. You're gonna have to love him. You're not going to spend eternity hating him or her and being happy as in hell. You're not going to do that either. You may tell him to go there in this life, but what happens is it switches around. And he goes to heaven and you go out. You see, you, you can't judge your life by revenge or creating consequences for somebody else. You can't get to heaven that way. I told you not too long ago about the class I was talking to, about sixth graders, I guess. I said, how many want to go to heaven? Everybody, except one kid. Wait in the back. I don't you want to go to heaven? He said, none of this bunch goes there. <laughs> I know you got a bunch in your mind you don't want to go with. But we can't act like that, and we can't think that way, because that's part of the word. Part of the word is, I must love as God loves, even when I'm not loved in return. 
That's a strong word. It's a heavy word. But hell is not some place, as our Holy Father said, that God places you. He never, never places anyone in hell. You go there because that's what you want. And isn't that a consequence, huh? It means you're so accustomed to a constant life of grievous sin that you're comfortable with it. You don't want to change. You don't want to be with God. You don't want to love God. So you put yourself down there. And we put ourselves in purgatory too because we're not ready. <laughs> when you were a child and you were going to a party uh, and you, you, you fell in the mud, then your mother had to wash you up. You can't go to a party with a muddy dress or, or trousers on. Well, that's what purgatory is. <laughs> you slipped up here. You weren't bad enough to go to hell and not good enough to go to heaven. Isn't it logical? Our Lord's mercy would find a place for you that you wasted so much time. We call that place purgatory. What a consoling doctrine we have. We're the only church in the world, I think, that has that awesome doctrine of purgatory. Some of you keep writing it off, but you may be there a long time if you're not careful. And then you'll be there, and one of the thoughts you're going to have is, Mother said I'd be here. <laughs> I won't laugh at you. I might say I told you so. <laughs> so, we have a call. Hello? Hi, Mother. Hi, how are you? Fine, thanks. And what is your question? Would it be correct to say that this love that we must have for God is itself a gift of God? Oh, and yeah. And two verses that come to mind are, um, no one comes to the Father unless the Spirit draws him, mm -hmm. or the other one would be, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Mm -hmm. You see, everything is a gift. Faith is a gift, love is a gift, but it's open to all. No one is excluded from the heart of God. It's what we do or don't do with it, you see? And that's why I love baptism so much. And the sisters don't celebrate birthdays. Yeah, we have a cake. We have one cake a month for all the birthdays, all together. But we celebrate with a mass and our baptismal day. That's the day we celebrate. Why? Because that's the day we became a child of God. Not that we weren't always children by the fact we're created by him. But we did not have indwelling. See what it says here? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We will come and make our home in him. And the gift of baptism secures. That's a real gift. Most of you are crying over that cold water on your head. You don't know what happened to you. But God knows. Oh, he just came and made his home in that little baby. Hmm. There's nothing. There's no gift like baptism. There's no gift like the Eucharist. There's no gift like confession. All the seven gifts. There's no gift like any of them. They're all there to make us strong and holy. Oh, it's a gift. And those who have not been baptized, you need to ask for it. You need to ask to be baptized, but you also need to ask God, Lord, what is it I need to know you better, to love you more? Huh? What is it I need? It is a gift. And the Lord said also in the scriptures, he said, it is the will of my Father that all men be saved. But when our Lord asked him, in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Father told him it's not possible because they don't want to be saved. See, it's a matter, it's our problem, not God. We must want to be saved. 
And when we have the gift of faith, hope, and love, which represents the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit at baptism, oh my, <laughs> all of heaven lives in that little baby. See, that's why to kill a child, a baby, is so bad. I hope one day our country will suddenly become aware of its great sin. Well, we have a call. Hello? Hi, Mother. Hi, where are you from? I'm from New Jersey. Oh, wonderful. What is your question? Um, my question is, um, since you mentioned the smoking, um, I, I've been having a battle trying to give up the smoking. and. Um, I went to confession, and when I confessed to this priest that um, I know that it's a sin for me to be smoking, he told me um, that we all have our vices, and as long as uh, I'm trying, that it's not a sin. Um, I'm just wondering what your comment would be. <laughs> you really want to know? If you feel it's harmful to you, it's a sin to harm your own body. It is. I mean, if you know if there's something wrong with your lungs or it affects your family, and these are bad effects, you're, you're obliged to quit. See? And that's drinking, too. It's just drugs, all of this, you know? I saw a woman not too long ago, we were going through a hotel, and she had a cocktail in one hand, a cigarette in her mouth, and she was pregnant. There's something wrong, huh? That you would carry a baby with a cigarette in one hand and a cocktail in another. See, that, I think he's wrong, I'm sad to say. I'm not bucking the clergy, but anything that harms your body, I'm not saying you're committing a mortal sin, but you could, I think, commit a very big imperfection and a venial sin because you're affecting your body. I went through a hospital one time and this whole ward were people, cancer patients, and I, I went to see one in particular, and this one man had just had his uh, larynx, is that what that is, taken out. He was smoking through a hole. A little hole here. Are you smoking? You see, there's something wrong. You know, I, I think that's sinful because you are deliberately going against the will of God that made your body wonderful, holy, and pure, and good. And even if you have a cancer operation, you know you're in trouble, buddy. You smoke anyway. <sighs> Do you love me? That's what he says to all. Do you love me? He said that to Peter, you know. Peter said to the Lord, all these will deny you. Though they all do, I will not. The Lord said, Peter, Simon, before the cock crows thrice, no, twice, you will deny me thrice. Oh. We don't know ourselves. You can't pass one highway without a billboard saying, mm -mm, don't smoke. So I, I would be careful, honey. I really would. We have another call. Hello? Hello. Hi, where are you from? Illinois. And what is your question? Okay, my question is, my wife and I were talking about this this morning, about if you break a civil law like speeding or something, you realize the consequences right away. Uh -huh. But if we break God's law, we don't. That's right. Because we're not told, like you said, the priest does not preach hell. Okay, now we're supposed to 
pray for the priest. And we read the other day we're supposed to go receive communion on Thursday for the priest. Why haven't we heard about this before? I, I've never heard of this before, and I think it would be a good idea if he would tell everybody to start receiving communion on Thursday for the priest in America. Well, I never heard it either, so uh, I don't think it's the law of the church. I think it's a good idea, though. You can pick any day. I would suppose whoever came up with the idea pick Thursday because Thursday is the day of the Eucharist. See? Sunday is the Trinity. Monday is the Holy Spirit, poor souls in purgatory. Tuesday, the angels. Wednesday, St. Joseph. Thursday, the Eucharist. Friday, the Passion. Saturday, Our Lady. Well, if we can dedicate our, our days on that level, Thursday would be the right day, but I think it's a private devotion. And I'm not, I'm not against it. I think it's a great idea. It's a great idea to pray for our Holy Father and pray for the priests, bishops, cardinals. Why? Because their responsibility is so awesome. Awesome. My responsibility is terrible before God. See, he's given us this network. He's given me the ability to talk to you. It may not be eloquent. It may not be sublime. It may not be intellectual, but it's all I got. What I have, I give you. Little that it is, but I give it to you free. Why? Because it was given to me free. I give it to you free. See? And it's true. You're right. Many consequences are not felt for a long time. I, all of you smoking, whoever you are, you haven't felt them yet. And I bet you smoked a pack a day. If not more than that, you know, I don't feel anything. <laughs> the day of reckoning is around the corner. Around the corner. You know, we treat our lives like a U-turn. You all know about a U-turn, huh? I saw one the other day. Where I wanted to go was there, but where I was going was there. So I, I looked at this big opening, and I thought, we could make a U-turn. And then sister said, uh, Mother, if you look about 20 feet ahead there, it says no U-turn. I know, really. <laughs> so we went all around the block. It dawned on me this morning that most of us make a U-turn in our lives. We want to do God's will, but when it costs, we make a U-turn right here. What was going to Jesus, what was going for Jesus, what was going with Jesus, we made a U-turn. We do everything for ourselves. The consequence? Risky. Why? I wouldn't want to die making a U-turn. That would be useless. And so maybe tonight you could remember, tomorrow morning, Lord, let me do everything with you and for you. Let me love you enough to do what you want and to keep your word that the Father and the Spirit in you may live within me. That should be a real simple prayer. And we make every effort to do it. And when we fail, well, there's an awesome gift of repentance and the gift of confession. And we have so much, so much. But we need light, don't we, huh? We need to know the consequences of our actions in the world. In our hearts. In our souls the consequences of our actions. When you know that, I think we could love the Lord a lot. And it's only through his love that, that we can do all these things. You see, this little rosary, it's a custom in our order to wear one. It's a Immaculate Conception rosary. 
Well, I got 30 seconds. Is that what you're telling me, Brett? I had it welded on. I don't want to take it off. I want to be constantly reminded of my vows and my obligation to God. Well, I'm not telling you, well, to have a holy conception rosary on your hand. But maybe if you knew there are two places to go, up and down, don't make you turns. Bye now. Thank you.